welcome to MMA True Fan, a biographical podcast series on legendary mixed martial artists. In this episode on Boss Rutan, hear exclusive interviews with Dwayne Ludwig, Kenny Rice, Frank Shamrock, Boss Rutan, and more. Please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. I may blow his tough guy image, but uh, the only thing, and we know Boss's famous liver kick, but the only thing in my mind more powerful than Boss's liver kick is his loyalty to friends. He never, he never forsakes that. And, uh, an example, I took my mom out to the studio one time, oh, several years ago. You know, she comes back home, and I have to be at her house. Uh, not long after that, she's on the phone talking. It was her birthday. And she's laughing and talking. I said, who are you talking to? She said, I'm talking to Boss Rudy. And uh, he, he maintained that relationship. He called my mom right up until she died on her birthday, on Mother's Day, on Christmas. And my father, thank God, still around. He's 90 years old. Uh, he went with me out to see Boss in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago. And he'll call my dad just to check on him and see how things are, you know, since mom's gone. And I think that speaks, to me, that speaks volumes about the man. He is genuinely interested in you and your family and how life's going for you. And it's not that passing through thing of, oh, how you doing? It's never that way with boss. And it's not just with me, but other friends I know that, uh, you know, he's gone the extra mile for. And when they're in trouble, it bothers him and he tries to help them. And there was never anything about boss that's phony. What you see on TV is the same boss that you'll meet. And uh, that's that says a lot about the character of the man. MMA True Fan presents Boss Rootin' by Rich Donahue and Nate Evans. A renaissance man can be defined as a person with many talents or areas of knowledge. They're usually creative and often pursue different arts and endeavors, including the martial arts. Sebastian Root was born on February 24th, 1965, in Tilburg, Netherlands, a city of about 215,000 people in the southern province of North Brabant. His father worked as a bookkeeper, and his mother worked as a wildlife conservationist. He endured many physical and emotional hardships as a child. When he was four years old, he came down with rheumatic fever, which put him in the hospital for about four months. During this time, he lost the ability to walk for a short period as well. He was six years old when his family moved out to the country closer to where his father worked. Shortly after arriving at his new home, he developed chronic eczema, a condition which often causes your skin to become red and itchy. In Boss's case, it became quite severe. I was covered with eczema when I came out of my mother, but I went away after a couple of months, never problem for the first six years, but then at six years old, it came and really heavy. I got it really over my hands, because I had to literally wear gloves because my hands were so disgusting. You know, it's, at times when I would make a fist, it would burst, and like pots would come out, so it, it was horrible, you know. You as a kid, uh, winter time was the best time for me because then I could cover myself with long sleeves, turtlenecks, and gloves. I never wanted to take off my gloves. Throughout most of his childhood, Boss would spend weeks and even months at a time in bed with bandages wrapped around his entire body. While it wasn't terribly painful, the itching became unbearable at times, as Boss explains. But the itching that was the the biggest thing. I would have a stone. Uh, next to my bed, and if it started itching, I would start hitting the stone because I preferred uh, pain over the itchy feeling. His mother would receive bed sheets from family members to tear apart. These would replace the ones he'd rip off in the middle of the night when the itching became more than he could bear. Routine cortisone shots and being slathered in skin creams from head to toe were normal occurrences for him. He was completely dependent at times, and his condition required round-the-clock care. He also developed a severe case of asthma. There were times when his asthma became so severe that it prevented him from being able to go outside. There are many times when he couldn't even make it up and down the stairs. I believe I was taking 45 pills a day. It was 15 in the morning during the day and then at night. So I had a lot of medication. I was a very weak kid. Eczema often leads to asthma in children. So to see him develop it wasn't a surprise. The two had an inverse relationship in a way. Whenever his eczema became severe, his asthma would subside and vice versa. When he was able to attend the local school in Eindhoven, Netherlands, He'd wear turtlenecks and protective gloves, which made him a target for bullying. His classmates called him a leper and teased him mercilessly. Students would often follow him after school and chase him into the forest near his home. He would climb trees and swing from one tree to another as he escaped their attacks. Some kids even climbed the trees after him until one became seriously hurt after a fall. 
forest. I was I spent a lot of time in the forest. I was really good in climbing trees and going from treetop to treetop, you know, which always came very handy when bullies would uh, try to, to get me, so to say, because I would climb in a tree and then I would wait till they're almost on the top and I start swinging left and right and then I went to the next tree and of course they didn't want to do it. So the forest was a place for me that was it's my second home. I spent either home or I was in the forest all the time. He had a secret home tree where he pretty much lived for a while. His parents would often get calls from neighbors about their son being up on street lamps and rooftops as well. His parents were loving and sympathetic, but they were careful in making sure they didn't coddle him. They didn't want him to feel sorry for himself or think he was different and weaker than the other children. He knew he wasn't weaker, though. He came from a family of track stars who had great athletic gifts. In physical education class, his superior athleticism always shined through. He found acceptance in sports, mostly because the other kids knew how good he was at everything. Bullies weren't boss's only issue at school. He was removed from multiple schools at a young age because, according to him, he was a little too much to handle. When he was 12 years old, his family went on vacation in the south of France. While they were there, Boss and his older brother snuck into a movie theater. We found a way to sneak in together with my brother, and we saw Bruce Lee. And that's where the light bulb went off. I realized that, wait a minute, if I become like that guy, you know, I can take care of my bullies. And that's pretty much where the journey started. He would return to movie theaters often to watch Bruce Lee's movies. He studied Bruce's punches and kicks, and then go home and practice them over and over again. This was obviously long before DVDs or anything like that, so he was merely going off what he remembered. This was the beginning of what we'll see again and again throughout his life, where he develops a passion for a skill, and then finds his own way to become great at it. He came from a conservative family, and it took him about two years to convince his parents to allow him to pursue training in martial arts. His parents saw the potential for violence and didn't want him getting involved. When he was 14, his parents finally gave him permission to train in Taekwondo. He found something he was good at right away. He found that he had a natural talent for striking. He'd also been drilling moves in his room for countless hours prior to taking formal classes. So he was able to transfer some of his homegrown skills into a new craft. Great thing as well. My neighbor was a really beautiful girl. There were two girls, two neighbor girls. They were really beautiful. And one of these girls had the toughest guy in town. His name was Xavier. In Holland, you would pronounce it Xavier. And, and he took me under his wing, so I went with him to the adult classes. And within months, I was dropping adults there with kicks to the body, you know. So I started hearing these adults talk about me in the dressing room, overheard them talking, and, and, and slowly but surely, I started getting, getting more confident. A short time later, he had an encounter with a local bully who was thought to be the toughest around town. And they screamed, hey, leper, watch out, your ears don't fall off, something along those lines. It was always something with the leprosy. And, uh, and this time I shouted something back. And I remember hearing them laughing, and I turned, turned around, and I saw them all. They started to chase me. And that's where I told myself, I said, it's over now. Uh, I went on the pavement, I put my bike on the stand, and I was just waiting for them. I said, I'm not going to run anymore. And um, they surrounded me with their bikes. When you look at a badass movie, you know, where these guys, they fight in the middle of the night, they fight these unsanctioned fights, and it's, they're surrounded yeah. by cars, and the headlights are the, the, the lighting for the fight. It was exactly yeah. like this, only with young kids with, with bicycles, and it was during the day. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they, of course, Shaki was his name. He started bouncing his chest into my chest and uh, challenging me. Hey, come on, Ruta, you want to hit me, leper? And I obliged. I gave him one punch. It was literally one punch. He blew me away. The guy was knocked out. His nose was flat on the face. That was a problem because then, of course, the police was alarmed since he had to go to the hospital. And that's when the police came to my mom and dad. And, of course, they took me off martial arts. He was now forbidden from participating in martial arts by his family, but he wasn't ready to let go of his passion for it. He continued training on his own and began collecting Bruce Lee movies to study his punches and kicks. You know, I started imitating him with the kicks. I was always very flexible, so I could imitate the side kicks. I could hold my legs like he did in uh, Enter the Dragon. That was the first thing I wanted to know. I thought it was so badass when he's focusing. He kicks with the side kick, and he holds the foot still, and then they open the door, and they, they talk to him, and he turns to the guy while he has that leg up in the air. I thought, man, that was the coolest thing ever. So I start mimicking everything that he did. Actually, a lot of people there, they thought I was a black belt, because, you know, of the moves that I had, but I had no fighting skills. A Renaissance man strives to maximize his potential and develop his abilities as much as possible. He spent a lot of time training in the woods. He would strap a foam pad to a tree and use it to practice punches and kicks he saw in Bruce's movies. He went on to do track and field in high school. He was successful in the high jump and long jump, but tendonitis in his knees caused issues for him. 
The tendonitis was believed to be caused by years of cortisone injections when he was a kid. He graduated high school when he was 17 years old and then entered culinary school. After studying French cuisine for three years, he began working at a restaurant. I had a really good instructor, the chef there. He was an, a really good cook, and he pretty much left me alone. So during the week, I was running the place. And I tried to, you know, I think my record was like 42 people one time that I did by myself. But this is like an appetizer main course and a dessert, you know. But I like the planning, the, the planning for those kind of things. Uh, so I always tried to get more and more people. I tried to do it if I could do it by myself. So I loved it. I, I, I love cooking. He was content working in the kitchen. He enjoyed cooking and was eyeing the possibility of opening a restaurant at some point. One night, things soured, though. And, uh, you know, I read out of preparation sauces, and he gets really angry at me, and he starts screaming at me. So I'm telling him, I say, listen, let's, let's bury it right now. Let's take care of these people, you know, and then afterwards you can get, tell me everything you want, me to, to, you want to say to me. But apparently he couldn't sh- shake it, so he kept screaming at me, and, and he told me that whatever he would tell me I was going to do, and I said, no, 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 that doesn't really work like that. And he grabbed a big bowl of butter, uh, and he said, if I throw this on the ground and I tell you to clean it up, you will clean this up. So I walked over to him. I hit the bowl of butter out of his hand. I said, ask me. And he says, you're going to clean that up. And I took my apron off, and I handed it to him, and I said, dude, so disrespectful. I've been running this place for such a long time and for you to do this, you know, and that was it. And of course, now he said, no, 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 because he had all these people inside. But that was it for me. I could not believe that after all the time that he would treat me like that. And that was it. I, I, uh, I jumped on my little motorcycle, my 50 cc thing, and I, uh, I get back <laughs> home and I never worked again. And that was just at the time when I started martial arts. So I started focusing more now on the martial arts. He moved out of his parents' house soon after. And it was during this time when he first started getting really serious about training in Taekwondo and Karate. He moved on to Thai boxing a short time later. It was during his first Thai boxing class where he received a shot that had become a staple in his repertoire, and a technique he would help introduce to the masses. The liver shot. So most people have no idea what a liver shot feels like. How would you describe the feeling of it? Oh, it just, uh, it cripples you. It's such an intense pain in the body. It feels you like can't breathe anymore. All the focus goes to that pain, so you're completely out of the fight. You know, it just, yeah, destroys you. That's what it does. And you have to understand, I was the guy. I was the man. I was the black belt who beat everybody in their gym, you know, and then I wanted to start Thai boxing full contact. So I thought I was a badass going into that uh, training. And, of, of course, my hands were lower. They were all pretty much on my hips. And he really uh, fast figured me out because if you give me two headshots, what happens is you overcommit to your defense because if your hands are not up, as soon as you get hit in the face, you bring him up way too fast, exposing the body. So I think the first time when he threw a combination, my hands went up. He already figured out the next combination. He was going to drop me, and, and, and he did. Uh, and that was excruciating pain. Never had an experience like that, not even with a kick to the body. Uh, he timed that really well. I was remembering laying on the ground and... I look at him and go, what is this? <laughs> you know, he goes, it's a, I couldn't even talk for, uh, for 30 seconds. But then he explained to me what it was. It was the liver, you know, and if you hit that really hard, it will do incredible damage. Then later, of course, when Roman Deckers, he was always my hero, when he started dropping people in Thailand with liver shots, I go, okay, now I really want to do this. Boss began competing locally six weeks later and found success right away. He went on to win 14 fights by knockout. He also found some modeling jobs around this time and even started working as a bouncer on the side. The next four years were kind of like a long weekend for him, with partying and bouncing and some street fighting along the way. Things came to a head for him on one New Year's Eve, when he supposedly agreed to fight with a dangerous opponent named Frank Loman. Loman was undefeated at the time, with nearly all of his fights coming by way of knockout. He was also getting out of prison just a few days before the fight. Boss was partying at the time, and didn't remember accepting it. In a quiet moment, he questioned whether he ever really accepted the fight. But at this point, he knew he couldn't back out because people would most likely call him a coward if he did. He was way out of shape, though, not even close to where he needed to be. He decided to start training at Meng Ho in Holland at around this time, with legendary Dutch kickboxing trainer, Cor Hemmers. Boss had a good camp, but didn't have enough time to get back in a good fighting shape. In his comeback fight, he lost by knockout. Boss's next fight was against Rene Roos, and it would be quite memorable for all the wrong reasons. He started out doing well in the fight, but in the second round, Ruse bit through his ear and nearly took it off. Boss retaliated by intentionally kneeing him in the groin as hard as he could. 
This led to a brawl outside the ring, between the corners. He would face a French kickboxer in his next contest. He trained hard for this fight, but came down with an infection that hampered his training when it got close to it. He was also involved in a street fight that landed him in police custody until just a couple of days before. He obviously wasn't very well prepared for this fight, but he managed to knock his opponent down multiple times in the first round. As the fight wore on, the effects of the medication he was taking for his infection took hold, causing him to become short of breath. His breathing issues became so bad that he could not continue and the fight had to be stopped. There were fans in attendance openly mocking Boss's coughing and laughing at him. He grabbed the microphone, voices discussed with some of the audience members, and left the fighting scene in Holland for good. In fact, Boss decided to step away from the fighting scene altogether for a while. He wanted to work in martial arts still, but his last few fights in Holland had left a bad taste in his mouth. He wanted to try something new, so he embarked on a new martial arts act. My uh, karate teacher, Roland, and I, we started doing these uh, choreographed fight scenes in nightclubs, like the middle of the night, at midnight, the lights would go down, the music stopped, and the people go, oh, what's going on? And then suddenly, boom, we're there with our pumped up bodies and spandex, whatever, you know, and we start doing these choreographed fights with sticks, with nunchucks, break tests, like flying kicks, kicking cigarettes out of the mouth and spinning back. It's like these really highly acrobatics, you know, kick him in the gut, and then he would grab my foot, throw me back. That came from the movie End of the Dragon. And then I would make a somersault, uh, a big uh, uh, somersault backwards, it would land and I'd knock him out. Boss would use some of his old Bruce Lee moves in his acts, like having his partner catch one of his kicks, and then doing a backflip when his partner throws him away. There were also dangerous elements, like when Boss used spinning roundhouses to get cups off people's heads. But the biggest draw to it was when they started using comedy more. Legendary Dutch grappler and trainer Chris Dolman saw one of Boss's shows one night. He was impressed with Boss's athleticism and energy. He invited Boss to join his gym. I was surprised he was so... Uh muscular and, and in the same time he was very uh, athletic and uh, he was quick and uh, I saw him and I talked I talked to him because I knew he was a kickboxer and I asked him to uh, join my uh, group and uh, we did free fight this moment in, in Holland it was not MMA it was free fight and it was about the same as MMA is now then, then he joined my gym, and uh, he came to train with me and some other guys. This would be his first real exposure to grappling and submission fighting, and it was a bit of a rude awakening for him. After getting choked out and submitted in every way imaginable, he started to drive home, but he quickly realized he didn't have enough energy to make it. So he pulled over, called his wife, and then fell asleep in his car. Boss wasn't going to let a good whooping get him down, though. He told his wife when he got home that he planned to go back there in six months and submit those guys. He kept working at it even though it was hard for him to find time to train outside of working as a bouncer, instructing, and traveling the 80 miles to Amsterdam to Dolman's gym. As time went on, he showed Dolman that he was a quick learner. Masakatsu Funaki and Minoru Suzuki approached Dolman about finding fighters for the new organization. Boss got a call at the last minute and had to travel to Amsterdam that night for the tryout. He found himself sparring at the tryout with a big-name Dutch fighter and former rings champion. It quickly became clear that his partner was trying to knock him out or hurt him to show off for the people that were filming in there. He got frustrated and knocked the guy out with a high kick that split his eyebrow open and sent him to the hospital for stitches. Funaki and Suzuki quickly took an interest in him. He made his debut in Pancras a couple of months later, on September 21st, 1993, a month before the debut of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. The UFC was very different in 1993 than it is today, and there were some things that made it seem as brutal and barbaric as possible. Japanese Pancras was quite different. While it was essentially mixed martial arts, it had modified striking rules like not allowing strikes on the ground and only allowing open-handed head strikes in the stand-up position. It was created by two submission fighting experts, and the rules seemed tilted to favor ground fighting as much as possible. It was more like a sport during a time when the UFC presented itself as more of a spectacle. Most fighters in the early UFC shows weren't known for having well-rounded fighting skills. In contrast, Pancras fighters had to be strong in all areas as legendary fighter Ken Shamrock shares. Pancras really forced you to be good on the ground in the stand-up because um, you couldn't, like, on the ground, sit in a guard and just ground and pound on somebody and then either knock them out or win on decision by landing because we didn't allow punches to the head. Um, you know, to the body, you could do it. But um, that really forced you to have to be really good at submissions. And then on the stand-up, you know, because it was open-hand strikes, you had to be more accurate with your strikes Open hand strikes aren't going to knock somebody out if you hit them in the head. But if you hit them in the face, chin, or nose, yeah, then you can knock them out. 
So you had to be a little bit more accurate with your striking. They also had rope escapes. So even if you caught a guy in a submission, the guy grabbed the rope, now you got to get up and do it again. So it really forced you to be well-rounded in all three areas, um, the, the clinch work, the, uh, the takedowns, and the striking. The Pancras fans were also quite different. In the early 90s, many UFC fans wanted as much violence as possible. Pancras fans were more studious. Pamphlets were passed out at the events with diagrams of each fighter's striking abilities, submission skills, strength, and other areas that fans could learn about. His first opponent, named Ryushi Yanakasawa, outweighed him by over 45 pounds. Not only was Yanakasawa much heavier than him, he was also taller. Boss dropped him right away with a straight palm strike. He actually thought it was over, but Yanagasawa got back up. Boss quickly dropped him again with another palm strike and finished it. There was a scary moment after the fight when Yanagasawa remained motionless on the ring floor with his eyes open. Yanagasawa got up a couple of times after a minute or two, but fell back down each time. He eventually had to be carried from the ring and ended up spending two nights in the hospital. Boss was concerned, not only for his opponent's health and safety, but for his own as well. In Holland, when a foreigner beat a Dutch fighter, he'd be lucky to make it out of the venue unscathed. In Japan, it couldn't have been more different. He was mobbed by fans following his win. People were putting babies in his arms for pictures. He was in the news, and people were bowing to him on the street the following day. He finished his second match with a knee to the body in about two minutes. His opponent, Takaku Fuke, was able to show that Boss's ground skills at the time had a lot of room for improvement. In his third fight, Boss would face Matsukatsu Funaki, one of the men who recruited him for their organization. Funaki had strong submission skills and actually ended his career with over 30 submission victories. Boss was still new to the submission game at the time. His ground training then was mostly just him rolling with the heavy bag. He actually hit Funaki with an illegal closed fist strike on the ground. He tried to apologize in the moment, but when he did, Funaki seized the opportunity to lock on a toehold and submit him three minutes into the first round. The rule set in Pancras obviously fosters submission fighting. He was going to have to adapt, and he knew his ground game would need to improve by leaps and bounds in a hurry. A Renaissance man is curious, creative, and always learning. He became obsessed with learning submissions and different locks during this time. Suddenly I got the, the jiu-jitsu bug, so to say. It, it, I got obsessed with it. The whole house was filled with little post-its with combinations on them, written on them. I would wake up my wife in the middle of the night because I would dream a submission. I would put her into submission and ask her where it would hurt. And then I would write it down, and the next day I would try it out in training, you know. So it was on my head all day long. I would walk through the kitchen, and I would say, hey, honey, come over here, lean over. And I would put it in a choke that I just thought I came up with. I'd say, are you getting dizzy, or is this hurting your throat? And she goes, I'm getting dizzy. i say, okay, that's a blood choke, so I'll write it down, you know. And that's constantly, I was working, but, you know, it paid off. Boss would bounce back with a submission win in 76 seconds over Ken Shamrock's Lions Den veteran, Vernon Tiger White. He quickly made an impression on the Japanese fans. He found himself in pancreas advertisements on huge billboard screens around Japan. In his next fight, he would actually use a submission that he randomly saw in a video promo while walking down the street in Japan. I saw that there was a story of you uh, copying a wrestling move that you saw on the street in Japan before a match. Is that, is that true? And yeah. What, 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 what was that move? Well, that's actually, that was an inverted heel move. We were walking on the street with a whole bunch of fighters, and suddenly we hear this voice saying, hybrid wrestling, pancreas. And we're looking to the side, and there's this giant screen. It, was, it covered a wall, an entire wall. And the first thing we see is me knocking out a person. That was my first fight. It was, it, it was a promo for the fight, for the show that we had the next day. So we all go like, oh, wow, you know, and we're watching the promo, and we thought it was super cool. And during that promo, I saw Takahashi was a fighter, he was sitting in, um, in half guard, and he grabbed somebody's heel for an inverted heel hook. He fell backwards, and he got him in the heel hook. And I'm looking at John Blooming, and I go like, wow, that's a cool move. I should uh, remember this. So the next day, I'm in that position, and I figure, yeah, might as well do it. You know? So I grabbed his heel, and I fell backwards. Now, since I never did it before, I had no clue uh, of what, what kind of pressure I was putting on his knee. So we heard it pop. We heard a knee pop, so I let him go immediately. And he stands up and he feels his knee and, he, and the referee says, are you okay? And he goes, yeah, I'm okay. And I see the amazed look on their face, big boy, and, and me too, because I heard it pop. What we didn't know was that his knee apparently was stronger than his shin bone. So his shin bone snapped already like half. It was already because of the twisting mo move. So they restart the fight and now he kicks me with that leg and I just flex my muscles and he, he connects and you see literally 
the leg bent, and then he fell down. It, it, he snapped his shit in half. Minoru Suzuki, the other man who recruited Boss for Pancras, would be his next opponent. Suzuki had been undefeated up until that point in his career, with seven wins, including wins over top guys like Ken Shamrock and Maurice Smith. Boss knew this was going to be one of the hardest fights of his young career. Boss opened the fight with a crushing kick and punch combination that put Suzuki down. Boss's wife immediately decided she didn't want any part of it and left the venue. Suzuki was tough. He got up and quickly nailed a beautiful sweeping double leg takedown. From there, Suzuki showed his superiority on the ground, swiftly moving from side mount to full mount and back with ease. Boss was holding on, but it was clear that he had to get out from underneath Suzuki before he found himself in trouble. Boss thought if he created an opening for Suzuki to attempt an armbar, he'd be able to escape it and scramble back to his feet. Suzuki went for the armbar and missed it but recovered beautifully to maintain his position. He then appeared to go for a leg lock that gave Boss an opening to escape. Boss got up and then quickly landed a devastating knee to Suzuki's liver, which sent him across the ring and put him down for good. The crowd was in shock. Suzuki was one of their heroes, one of their golden boys, and Boss left him in a fetal position in the ring. This victory took Boss's confidence to another level. Uh, when I started rolling, I always thought, because since I was my own teacher, pretty much, that my level of submissions was not even close to their submission game, like the guys from the Lions Den and all the other fighters that came over. Until I one time I was rolling with them uh, before our fight, you know, a couple of days before we were at the Pankers Dojo, and I was rolling with these guys, and that's when I realized that I was much better than I thought I was. That was also the moment that I came home and I told my wife, I think I can be a world champion in this thing. I mean, I had no clue that I was this good, so to say, because I had no problems with him. And so, so that's where everything started. First, the win fight with Suzuki, then started rolling with the other guys, and that really put me into perspective where my level was, and it was much higher than I always thought it was. Boss would next face one of the most famous fighters in the world at the time, Ken Shamrock. Boss stepped in to engage right away, but slipped and ended up on his back, with Ken on top of him, one of the worst positions to be in. Ken stayed on top and went for a leg lock that Boss stopped with a rope break. Ken then continued to show his superior wrestling and ground skills throughout most of the fight. At one point, Ken looked to be going for what appeared to be an arm triangle that wasn't really anything, but Boss used this as an opportunity to escape. Boss rolled over to his knees, which created an opportunity for Ken to catch him in a rear neck choke at the end of the fight. Boss and Ken quickly became friends following their fight. Ken shared some of the qualities he admired about Boss. I really liked him. I thought that uh, his approach to the fight game was a lot like Maurice Smith, where they came in and knew that they were good at striking, but um, knew that coming into this was just a different game, and they were wide open to learning. And I think that was a testament to his character and his personality about wanting to be great. Uh, was that he knew he had to learn, and therefore he was willing to learn from everyone. Boss would bounce back with a submission victory over Lions Den fighter Jason DeLucia. In December of 1994, he would participate in one of the greatest events in mixed martial arts history up until that point, the King of Pancras tournament. The winner of this tournament would be crowned the first King of Pancras. He would enter this tournament as a number one seed, along with three other fighters. In his first match, he would face a fourth member of the Lions Den, Ken's younger brother Frank Shamrock who was making his mixed martial arts pro debut. While Frank was new to the sport, he'd been fighting nearly his entire life, and his experience showed in the ring. Frank took the fight to the ground right away with a beautiful scooping takedown. Frank then worked toward an armbar attempt, which led to Boss escaping and gaining position. This fight had action from both fighters, lots of submission attempts, lots of escapes and reversals. After 10 minutes of extremely close action, Frank won the fight via majority decision. Frank showed strong wrestling throughout the fight, scoring many of the takedowns, which may have been the difference. One of Frank's strongest memories from their first fight was of something we couldn't see. The biggest thing for me was the, uh, his talking and stuff. He was just talking. He was very present and talking to himself. I realize now, years later, I thought he was talking to me. He wasn't like talking to himself. And it was just surreal. I was having this moment where I was fighting you know, for my life in a foreign country, all these things going on, and then he's talking to stuff in, you know, a funny accent. You know, I'll never forget that. And it was funny stuff. It was like, oh, I got you, and I'm so strong, and, and uh, you cannot escape. You know, all these, <laughs> now that I know about, there's all these cool things to, you know, pump himself up. So I really like Frank. always liked Frank. And, but during the, you know, if he would go for an armbar, he would try, I would say, 
I feel it. You're working for an hour. Don't even bother. You know, like I would talk to him and then he would start talking back. And I would every time, uh, you know, when he tried to do something, I say, I'm too strong for you, uh, brother. You cannot do that. And he, when he does it, he's always, I'm too strong for you. You know, he, 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 makes, he makes me Arnold Schwarzenegger in my speech if he tells <laughs> yeah. the story. It should be noted that Boss had some peculiar methods to help himself keep focus and try for a psychological edge in his fights. If you look at his hands and his pancreas fights, you'll see a capital R on the back of them. When he first started fighting in Pancras, he was concerned about having a single 30-minute round, as opposed to the five three-minute rounds he was used to. He was an aggressive fighter. What would happen if he tried knocking his opponent out early but couldn't? He'd be gassed with 25 minutes left and would likely get mauled by whoever he was fighting. To stop himself from being too aggressive, he put two R's in the back of his hands, which in Dutch stood for the word rustic, which means relax in English. So whenever he found himself getting too worked up or excited, he would use the R's in the back of his hand to help him relax. Boss bounced back and finished his next opponent, Mananabu Yamada, with an arm triangle choke in just over a minute. Immediately after it ended, Yamada took longer than normal to regain consciousness. An indelible image from this fight was of the referee holding Yamada in his arms, trying to revive him. Yamada, it's hard to say, but it looked like a dead body for a few seconds. Boss rushed over to check on him and was clearly relieved when Yamada woke up a few seconds later. This win would set up the rematch with Ken Shamrock that Boss had been longing for since their first fight. Ken knew he was facing a different Boss this time. He had studied, and so therefore his submission skills and everything that he did uh, was equal to mine at that time because he had time or just about um, as much time as I did to start learning the submission game. You know, he got the guard. He knew, you know, how to stay out of chokes. He knew how to stay out of arm bars, leg locks. And so I knew going into that fight that I had to set him up. Um, in order to get a submission, whereas in the first one, I just felt like I could ride him out uh, and and kill some time on the clock and uh, be able to catch him with the submission. The second one, I knew I had to set him up. It wasn't going to come that easy. While his skills had improved in the eight months since their first match, Ken submitted him with a knee bar a minute into their fight. It was a frustrating loss, and it would ultimately be the last of his career. He was a student of the sport, and he was always looking to learn from his setbacks and losses. He became obsessed with studying his fights and honing his techniques. When he did something wrong or lost a fight because of a mistake, he would drill those techniques and setups to ensure it never happened to him again. In fact, he would practice a move so diligently that he'd be able to work it into his own game and become an expert in his own right. Such is the case with his second loss to Ken Shamrock. He was so frustrated with the way that fight ended, he worked on knee bars, heel hooks, and other leg locks religiously. He would go on to defeat his next three opponents via leg locks, with each fight lasting less than three minutes, against opponents like legendary kickboxer and fighter Maurice Smith, and past opponents Jason DeLucia and Dakaku Fouquet. His next fight would pit him against a familiar foe, Frank Shamrock. Boss had been wanting a rematch with Frank since their last fight, seven months prior. Both fighters had grown since their last match, and were ready to showcase their skills. Frank explains his preparation and game planning for this fight, or lack thereof. I didn't really have much of a game plan. And I didn't, it was one of my thinking I was getting really good, so I didn't train that well. But, you know, besides whacking on me a little bit, and it, it didn't really hurt me or, or catch me or almost catch me in anything. I could, like the, you know, when I wrestled with Japanese, they would tear my knees out and, and they would really strain me and hurt me. Uh, Boss didn't, but when I fought him again, I was like, ah, I only need to be like, you know, 90%. And so I just didn't, I didn't prepare as much. And I thought I could catch him. And a few submission this fight went as many people probably expected, with Boss landing big strikes and Frank getting big takedowns. At one point, Frank and Boss went through the ropes and out of the ring. Frank was a little rattle climbing back into the ring. Boss believed it was from a strike before they left and thought the ref should count it like a knockdown, but that didn't happen. Boss would go on to win via split decision in a fight that seemed even closer than the first one. Frank was forced Boss to become innovative as a fighter. The rules seemingly put him at a disadvantage at first, but that didn't deter him. He found a way to make the rules work for him. The open hand to the head rule limited the stand-up striking aspect of the game. A lot of fighters would slap their opponents to set up a move or to frustrate them. Boss used palm strikes differently than most Pancras fighters. He threw palm strikes with the force of a punch when most fighters were slapping each other. Boss found that palm strikes could be even more effective than punches when he and his opponent were close together. A palm strike allowed for a few extra inches to generate more force than with a punch. These few inches made a huge difference for a striker with Boss's power. He took a rule that was meant to eliminate his striking ability and actually used it to improve his striking. This showed Boss's ability to innovate 
and use his intelligence as a fighter. Jason DeLucia had an interesting take on it. Yeah, his, his intelligence was uh, dogmatic, and I've said this before, but anybody who, who can carry a genius intelligence in another language, you got to figure his intelligence overall is even greater than that by a lot. Faust would face one of his main rivals during this time in Frank Shamrock. By this time, Frank had become the King of Pancras, and this fight would be the rubber match for Frank's belt. For the third one, I, I for certain thought I was going to beat him just from a technical standpoint. And yeah, I did the same thing. I, you know, maybe I was about 85% for number three. Uh, but I, I could see Boss was just slow moving in his submission attempts and stuff. And the game was really about submissions once you got into a 30 minute game. And I knew he was super strong, but I just did, you know, I knew if he got me, it would hurt you. But I didn't think he could, he could catch me. And so I thought I could, you know, finesse it and, and tap him or choke him. Or, I was thinking of choking that, but I thought I could choke him. But I just, he's so strong and he's so stubborn that, uh, yeah, it just it took, the, it took the energy out of me. And, um, and then he beat me up. Boss would next face Jason and Lucia for a third time. Boss and Jason had gotten to know each other outside of the ring. And Boss even helped Jason with a couple of things. He would, even after, after our first fight, he realized that I realized that he was a much bigger fish from a much bigger pond. And he wouldn't have problems. He would teach me things in, in the Pankers Dojo. And like a lot of great fighters, they don't have to show you a lot for you to learn a lot. They can show you one thing, and it's a base for a whole system of other things. And he, he showed me a lot of things. He, he was really, and he's like Maurice Smith, who, between the two of them and Guy Metzger, probably those are the three greatest martial artists to, to me that came out of Pancras as martial artists. And But for a very short period of time, they could show you very succinct things that could make a big difference in everything that you do. This fight contains some of Boss's most memorable highlights. With a brutal liver punch knockdown and a kick to the body, they finished the fight. His next fight would be against Masakatsu Funaki. This would be his chance to avenge the first loss of his career. Funaki was still one of the top guys in the organization. Boss's only other losses were to Frank and Ken Shamrock. He beat Frank Shamrock twice after losing to him. He lost to Ken twice and tried to get a third fight with him but couldn't. He needed to beat Funaki. Boss would rely on his conditioning to be a key weapon in this fight. Funaki was known for finishing his fights quickly. He had never fought for more than 15 minutes. Boss wanted to take him into a longer fight that would test his stamina. Funaki got Boss in a nasty heel hook a few minutes into the fight. It looked like yeah. he had you in like a heel hook very early on. Or it was like a toehold hybrid heel hook. And yeah. I mean, your leg looked like a corkscrew. So, I mean, like, I thought it was over. Yeah, me too. You know, because I, I remember me looking at my leg and somehow I'm thinking, I'm not feeling it. I don't know what's going on, you know, because, yeah, you my, my leg was almost a 180 degrees reversed uh, with that uh, heel hook. He did a heel hook with, the sto- with my toes in his neck. And then he pushed it to the side. So, yeah, it was very close, but I, I didn't feel any pain, so I just didn't tap. And then, thankfully, I didn't, because then later on, yeah, I knocked him out. Boss caught Funaki in a couple of guillotine choke attempts, but Funaki quickly slipped out. Boss later said he felt like Funaki had his hair greased up for that reason. Funaki controlled much of the ground action for the first few minutes of the fight. Once Boss got back to his feet, he delivered a strong palm strike that put Funaki down. He knocked him down again a second time with another palm strike. He then decided to go in for the kill. Forget about the 15 minutes. He was going to finish it. Boss knocked him down a couple of more times, but each time Funaki went down, he got back up with more enthusiasm, like he was seemingly getting stronger. Boss was unrelenting with his strikes, though, and actually increased his volume as the fight wore on, which was part of his initial plan. Funaki was hanging in there, though, but he was clearly getting the worst of their exchanges. Funaki's durability was starting to get the boss a little. He knew he'd given Funaki his best, and Funaki was still coming back for more. Funaki's nose was crooked and broken, his cheekbones broken and swollen. His spirit still intact, though. That was until Boss landed a crushing knee to the head and left Funaki face down on the mat and unconscious. Boss later said that he gave Funaki everything he had with that last knee. Boss's palms were severely black and blue after this fight. Boss faced Manabu Yamada next, and won with a 54 second toehold submission. It was at around this time when one of his most legendary street fights took place as well. Street fighting was something that he would dabble in on occasion when he was out of bars. Being a famous fighter, he was an easy target for people wanting to test themselves, and as a bouncer, it was inevitable. In this instance, he was at a bar in Sweden where he was doing a seminar. When he first walked in, the bouncers told him to stay calm tonight, which was his first indication that he might have a problem. He thought twice about going in, 
but he had been drinking and wasn't really worried about it. Expecting Boss to remain subdued in a bar setting or any other setting is probably unrealistic, Frank Shamrock explains. Um, I would say he's like a living cartoon character. Just a boisterous, exuberant, you know, fun guy. Boss was making jokes and being himself, but it didn't take long for the bouncers to get after him. He was stopped by a few of them who took him into another room. They told him that he had to leave because he was being disruptive and bothering the customers. Boss agreed to leave without issue. This reaction surprised and baffled the bouncers. One of them then shoved Boss and another poked him in the eye. Boss knocked out all five of them, but quickly realized they were going to wake up and he'd be doing it all over again. He knew he had to leave as soon as possible. The police showed up almost right at this time, and Boss was arrested because one of the bouncers he knocked out was actually a police officer. Boss's legal issues had just begun. A couple of days later, he was able to make his first phone call after befriending some of the guards at the jail. After talking to his wife, he talked to his lawyer, who told him he'd be facing six to nine months in jail for assaulting a police officer. Boss insisted he didn't start the altercation, but his lawyer said that didn't matter because the five guys he knocked out, including the police officer, all said he did. In the end, some of Boss's people spoke with their people, and the charges were ultimately dropped. Boss relinquished his title following the Amato fight to be present for the birth of a second daughter, Sabine. He would return to Pancras on March 22, 1997, for a match against Osami Shibuya. He suffered a fractured sternum during this fight that he actually had to receive surgery for when he got back to Holland. He said the injury occurred while he was trying for an armbar. He said he could feel something pressing against his lungs when he'd breathe. The doctor at ringside couldn't find anything wrong at the time, so he continued fighting and finished with a draw. His next fight was against the King of Pancras in his weight division at the time, Kiyoma Kuninoku. Kuninoku held victories over Frank Shamrock, Guy Mesger, and other top fighters. During the fight, Kuninoku demonstrated his grappling dominance early on. It seemed to be a step ahead at times. Boss caught Kuninoku in a toehold, about 10 minutes into the fight, that looked like it should have ended it, but Kuninoku somehow escaped. He also had a key lock secured at the end of the fight that appeared to have Kuninoku in serious trouble before the bell rang. He went on to win a decision on lost points by Kuninoku, fought his lost points for things like getting knocked down and rope escapes. Following this fight, Boss addressed the crowd from the center of the ring and said he broke a bone in his chest in a pass fight and wasn't able to perform like he normally does and that he wasn't 100% for his fight against Kuninoku. He finished his next opponent, Takaku Fuke, with a submission in a little over four minutes. His next fight would be his rematch against the guy he had his chest injury against, Osami Shibuya. He told Frank Shamrock, Jason DeLucia, and some others that he was going to finish his opponent with a new neck crank that he'd been working on in the gym. He got Shibuya in a headlock from side control. He then rolled on his back and locked Shibuya's leg with his left arm. He then just pulled and stretched Shibuya to submit him by neck crank. At around this time, in October of 1997, the Pride Fighting Championships held their first event in Tokyo, Japan. Boss found himself in Japan at the show, not as a commentator, but as a cornerman. A chance encounter gave him an opportunity that he made the most of. So I was training uh, Marco, who was at Marqueur uh, for a Pride Fighting Championship. So I went with him as a, for, to be, as a trainer in the corner. And this was with the fight with uh, Marqueur was there. And we, of course, we're in the backstage. We're watching the show that is going on at the time. So they, they, they stream it to the TV into the dressing room. And I'm sitting there with Yukino and Hideki, like you said, and I see this guy, he's setting up an armbar or whatever it was. I go like, oh, watch, he's going to get him in an armbar. And they're looking and they say, well, he's not doing it. I said, just give it 10 seconds. And then boom, 10 seconds later, he goes for the armbar. And they look at me and say, how, do you, how did you know that? I said, well, you, you can see it. You can see what he was working. I can see he's setting it up. And then it happened right away with another fight that was with the knee bar, uh, I believe it was with Sakurabi, he was sitting on all fours and his opponent was behind him uh, and he had his knee in between the legs of Sakuraba. I said, oh, he's going to roll in and he's going to roll him into a straight knee bar because I saw Sakuraba already looking at the leg. And sure enough, five, six seconds later, he rolls and he wins the fight by knee bar. And that's when they said, hey, would you like to be a commentator? Because, I mean, if you can see these things coming, the setups, I think you could be uh, great as a commentator. So how, that's how I got the job. Boss would be teamed up with commentator Stephen Quadros. Quadros, also known as the Fight Professor, was an established editor, columnist, and kickboxing instructor at the time. Boss and Stephen had actually worked together prior to working for Pride while helping one of Stephen's former students. One of my students was started to train down at Beverly Hills Jiu-Jitsu, which had classes being taught by Marco Huas, who was a UFC champion, Mark Kerr, who became a UFC champion, Rob Common, who was a legendary kickboxer from Holland, and Boss Rutten. 
And so this student of mine started to compete. His name is Giovanni Lem. He started to compete on the local uh, circuit under Pancrase rules. And on several occasions, Boss helped me corner him. So he and I had, you know, a, a, a good relationship, you know, and we'd be, we were friends. We, we would hang out, you know, and it was, you know, we'd pursue acting and whatnot. So before we actually worked together in the broadcasting booth, uh, we had a friendship and a collaboration. Quadros had experience working in sports media, where Boss was still a full-time fighter and had hardly any experience commentating. It would be reasonable to expect Boss to be a little rough around the edges at first, but Quadro shared how quickly things came together for him. Boss has natural entertainment proclivities. He's, he's a natural-born showman, and he's got that rough voice. He's, he's got this very tough guy, masculine voice, and he's a superb technician who kind of almost invented his own way of, of fighting after he became a black belt and multiple styles of karate, taekwondo, kyokushin, and then he r- really started to get his ground game together in the Pancrase organization. He kind of created his own style as a broadcaster, all those things inside of him, the knowledge, the, 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 the funny guy, he's really, really funny, dude. Uh, you put all those things together and you can't miss it's not like he had to go to some school and learn them. Boss had done commentary for one show prior to working for Pride. That was at IFC 1, Combat Kiev, where he saw a young, eager Wolf Chanchin win a single event tournament in March of 1996. One of Stephen's friends, the late sportscaster Gary Cruz, had worked with Boss before and informed Stephen of an issue that should probably be addressed. He said, oh, he's great, he's great. I said, yeah, yeah. He said, but he likes to say fuck a lot. And I thought, oh. And, you know, me, personally, it's not like I never use that word. I use it quite frequently, actually. <laughs> yeah. But not on a, a broadcasting thing. So Boss and I are in Tokyo before our first show, a day or two before, and we're out having sushi. And so we're talking, talking, talking. And I say, oh, Boss, one more thing. Um, uh, during the broadcast, you can't say fuck. And he, and, he, and he looked at me and goes, yeah, no problem, Steve, no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. <laughs> Boss's next fight would be in December of 97 against Kilichiro Yamamiya. This event was held the night before a UFC event in the same city, so there are some extra spectators, including UFC fighters in the crowd. Boss caught Yamamiya in a rear naked choke and had it on full, but Yamamiya was able to get a rope escape. When Boss let him go, it looked like Yamamiya was unconscious. Yamamiya appeared to wake up, and it looked like he didn't know where he was for a second. Then he stood up, and the referee restarted the action. Boss quickly threw a high kick that missed, but then followed it with a kick to the body that landed. Yamamiya caught the kick and went for the takedown, but Boss fell right into another rear naked choke and submitted him. Boss had an act for pleasing the Japanese fans. He would do flying splits after his fights, to their delight, and he also had a flair for the theatrical. He'd get the microphone and make big announcements like that his wife was having a child, or even to challenge famous fighters in the audience, like in his next fight. When Boss fought Kengo Watanabe, he had a special guest, Hickson Gracie, in attendance. Watanabe was ready to strike with Boss, but wasn't afraid to stand toe-to-toe with him. Boss landed a lot of big shots, and took some big shots himself. There were a couple of times where Watanabe went charging at Boss like he was just going to bull him over. Boss knocked him down repeatedly until the referee stopped it. After the fight, Boss got the microphone and challenged Hicks and Gracie to a fight. Unfortunately, this fight would never come to fruition. Boss's submission game had come a long way since the night he couldn't even drive home after getting choked out and mangled at Domans. By the end of his career, Boss wound up with more submission wins and knockouts. This speaks to the mentality Boss always carried with him. He was always seeing problems and setbacks as opportunities. Keeping your composure and staying focused during a fight requires great mental strength and stamina. Boss was known for having great conditioning, and prided on it, saying it was the only thing in the fight that you can control. Fighters often make mistakes when they're tired. Boss's stamina helped him stay focused during his fights, and avoid making costly mistakes. During Boss's MMA career, we saw him do just about everything, such as knockouts, liver shots, submissions, broken bones, controversial decisions, you name it. One thing we never saw was the lack of respect for his opponents. Boss was never one to hype up a fight by being disrespectful and controversial. Why is that? Why wouldn't Boss ever say rude or disrespectful things about his opponent leading up to a match? Why didn't he make brash predictions before his fights? Was he that much of a class act? 
He'd probably be fine with people thinking that, but the real answer was more calculated. For Boss, being disrespectful to opponents or making outrageous predictions put unnecessary pressure on him. He knew that he was going to have to back up everything he said. There was already enough on the line. No need to make it harder on yourself or give your opponent extra motivation. The same thinking applied when he was asked who he was fighting for. He always said he was fighting for himself. Not his family, not his friends, or anyone else. Again, that would bring unnecessary pressure on him to win. It just wasn't logical for him to say or do those kind of things. One of the more surprising facts about Boss is the fact that he ended his career with more submission victories than knockouts. There have been other great strikers who were also great submission fighters, but no other strikers who were even close to Boss's level had more submission victories than knockouts. This speaks to how well Boss was always able to adapt and adjust to the situation he was in. Pankras was tailored to submission fighting. Boss was a perfect type of fighter to come in and get beaten by these guys. Yet, he was able to grow his game and adapt to the organization he was fighting in, to beat many of those fighters at their own games. Following this fight with Watanabe, Boss decided to move on from Pancras and compete in another organization, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Boss always had aspirations of becoming an actor and working as an entertainer in some capacity. He had a gift for it, even as a kid. When he moved to America, he was told that people would recognize him from Pancras. Unfortunately, that wasn't really the case because most people in America were watching UFC at the time. Boss had wanted to compete in the UFC for a long time anyways, and now would be his chance to show his skills to a new audience. He held victories over Murray Smith and Frank Shamrock, both of whom went on to become UFC champions, so he felt good about his chances of being successful. The UFC was happy to have him as well. He had been undefeated in his last 19 fights, and the UFC promoted him as the world's greatest martial artist. Boss's first fight would be against Japanese star Shiyoshi Kosaka at UFC 18. I knew him. He, he, he was great. He fought at rings at the time. He was training uh, with Maurice Smith and Frank Shamrock. They were a team at that time as well. So we, I knew he had great striking coaches and, uh, and his judo. Well, he's a black belt coach on judo, so I knew he was going to be a tough guy. Boss suffered a serious neck injury just prior to his fight and training. Daryl Golar, he was a fighter. He also fought in the UFC. He threw me on my neck. I had him in a triangle choke and he lifts me up in training and he slaps me on the ground. Not only on the ground, like my head hit also the, the wall and it really affected my neck. So that's why in the beginning of the fight, it's hard for me to stop the takedowns because I couldn't do any takedown defense. But, you know, I think after two or three minutes, I start seeing everything and then I became uh, more in the zone. I remember this piece, you probably read it as well, that the final overtime came and I, I figured him out. I, I, so I told my corner, I said, okay, just let me know when I got a minute left, I'm gonna knock him out. And I remember turning around and behind me was Big Joe McCarthy. He actually wrote this in his book as well. And he had this smirk on his face. He walked away like shaking his head, like whatever, you know? And then you will hear my corner go one minute left. And I think 10 seconds later, I knocked him out. And I, uh, Big John, he gave me the, the shirt that he was wearing that time as a referee after the fight. He said, here, get my shirt. He said, that was insanity. I heard your corner say, uh, you're telling your corner that you were going to knock him out to the last minute if they would shout one minute left, and then you did it. I say, yeah, I figured him out, and I figured it. I figured at the end of the fight, I'm just going to unload. You know, you always have a risk of being taken down because once you plant your feet, you start throwing power shots if he takes you down. But at least that happens that at the last minute, and hopefully it's not going to count. You know, that went all went through my head. That's why I said, okay, let's wait to the last minute. Just give me a sign, and I'll go for it. And uh, thankfully, it worked out. Boss's UFC debut lived up to the billing. His knockout win over Shioji Kusaka in the final minute made the fans happy and everyone took notice. His next fight would be against another rising star, two-time NCAA wrestling champion Kevin Randleman. Randleman was coming off a unanimous decision win over Maurice Smith at UFC 19. This was during a time when fights were still being billed as one skill against another. and This fight was a classic striker versus grappler match. Randleman took Boss down right away and began pounding on his face. For the first few minutes... Randleman landed several heavy hammer strikes from the top position, and it looked like Boss was in trouble. Boss tried for submission attempts throughout, and whether the onslaught of punches the best he could. Boss's nose was broken early on in the fight, and his eye took a lot of damage as well. As the fight wore on, Boss's stamina began to show, as he started outworking Randleman from his back. Boss began landing elbow strikes again and again to the top and sides of Randleman's head. At the end of the first 15-minute period, it appeared as though Randleman was winning. But Boss looked fresher in the two three-minute overtime rounds. He hit Kevin with a hard liver kick early in the first overtime period that took a lot of energy out of him. Kevin got the takedown again in both rounds, but Boss was more active throughout. While Kevin was on top, 
It looked like Boss was doing more damage from his back. Boss went on to win a split decision. It was considered to be controversial at the time, and it's still debated today. Boss is now the UFC heavyweight champion of the world, his fourth world title. But his body wasn't cooperating with him. He had developed tendonitis in his arms, and his condition had worsened to where his pain was almost unbearable at times. Uh, oh, I'm just sick of it thinking about it. I mean, I could not, was not able to eat because of the pain, and it's really weird. I would feel a little, a little thick in my, uh, in my arm if I hit the back really hard. I would feel that bloop in my arm, and I go, oh, here we go. You know, then from that moment, I would have 45 minutes, and you can put a clock on it. I don't know why that is. And then the pain would start for like an hour and a half, two hours, super intense pain. There's nothing that you can take for it because it feels like it comes from the inside going out. It's like almost like your bone are getting, your bones are getting very hot and it's radiating outside. It would make me, I was miserable, you know? So now I, once that hit me, that meant that because I'm going to need three weeks rest in order to, to come back from it. But you know, if you're in preparation for a fight and you're still five weeks out, that means that I only have 45 minutes train workouts two times or three times a day. And I, and I know beforehand I'm going to be in insane pain after those 45 minutes. So, you know, I started losing weight. Like I said, I couldn't eat anymore from the pain. And, you know, it became miserable. I never, uh, I said, I, d- I don't want to do this anymore. It's, it's too miserable for me right now. Boss relinquished his heavyweight title and attempted to move down to middleweight at 205. But his tendonitis and other injuries forced him into retirement. Boss's mixed martial arts career was one of the most dominating in the sport's history. Fight Metric does a lot of official stats for the UFC. They researched Boss's career and created a statistical analysis for it. In the 4 hours, 27 minutes, and 8 seconds of Boss's professional fighting career, he scored 13 knockdowns without getting knocked down himself. His significant strike accuracy was 70.6%, which is the highest fight metric had ever recorded. He attempted a record 53 submissions. He also successfully swept his opponents a record 46 times. Boss lost to only three fighters, and he avenged two of those losses. The only loss he didn't avenge was to Ken. Boss later agreed to a third fight with Ken in the Pride Fighting Championships in 2000, but Ken declined, stating he'd already beaten Boss twice and that a third time wasn't necessary. In 2002, Bruton said that he wouldn't fight Ken again because of the friendship they developed over the years and that he couldn't put his heart and soul into a fight with him. Boss would go on to be inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame years later. Retirement can be a difficult time in the lives of professional athletes, but Boss seemed to take it in stride. He had plans and goals. He liked to participate in professional wrestling on occasion. He made his debut at Inogi Bumbayi 2000. He was teamed up with Alexander Otsuka and went against Rico Rodriguez and Naoki Sano. He went on to submit Sano with a cross-faced chicken wing. He wrestled singles matches most of the time and beat rookies and many veterans as well. In July of 2002, Boss would lose a championship match to Yuji Nagata. Boss dropped down to a lower weight class and wrestled for the championship but came up short once again. Boss's professional wrestling career was short-lived. It was a time he enjoyed from an entertainment standpoint. Boss considered trying professional wrestling in the United States and had an opportunity at one point, but the sacrifice wasn't worth it to him. You know, I almost did. Uh, very close we were. And uh, it would be with uh, Oleg Taktarov, Marco Huas, and myself. They wanted to make us a team, They're like the foreign power, they would call it. And then we would take on the Americans, you know. That, that was our goal. But once we started talking... Uh, we were talking about doing 220 shows a year. And I thought it was like pro wrestling over in Japan. I could get away with like 10 shows a year or 15 shows a year. So then when my second daughter was just born and uh, and I declined. And, and it was a hard decision because it was good money and I, uh, I needed it at the time as well. But I realized if I do that, if it's 220 shows, you can only imagine you're never home because that's without the traveling. And then I would not see my daughter grow up and I didn't want to take that risk because it was time that I could never get back. By the time Boss decided to retire from fighting, his broadcasting career in Pride had really taken off. He was able to draw from his experience as an entertainer in Holland and combine it with his knowledge as a fighter and trainer to provide priceless moments of insight and humor. Boss and Steven had an unmistakable chemistry in the broadcasting booth. They were often considered to be among the best broadcasting teams in the sports history. At one point, they even started doing mini skits together as an opener for the English version of the Pride events. Boss later worked with a gentleman named Damon Perry before being teamed with Mauro Ranallo. 
Boss and Mario also had unmistakable chemistry and worked together for the next few years until Boss decided to step away from Pride to spend more time with family. Prior to his fight with Kevin Randleman, Boss hosted his first mixed martial arts tournament in Denver, Colorado in February of 1999. It was aptly titled The Boss Root and Invitational. This became a series of five tournaments held throughout the year, all in Denver. It was during this time when Boss would begin a relationship with a young man who would soon become his top student, Dwayne Bang Ludwig. But it was so crazy one time, there was a 16-man tournament. He had to fight four times in one day. And Dwayne was doing a kickboxing event at one of those, uh, a kickboxing fight at one of those events. And I remember that his opponent backed out. And now we had no opponents. So we grabbed the microphone and we just addressed the audience and said, so by any chance, somebody who wants to fight, you know, who wants to tie box because you don't have an opponent. And this one guy jumps up and he says, I'll fight him. And Dwayne was this little guy, you know, he's a skinny dude. And um, I remember the guy jumping up, realizing he was much heavier than Dwayne. And I look at Dwayne, I say, are you okay doing that? Because Dwayne, I think he was 18 or 19 years old. And uh, Dwayne says, sure, I'm okay. And I go, oh, that was the first plus point that he got with me, taking a fighter that you don't know anything about, who's heavier than you. And I came down and he, he dropped the guy with a high kick. He knocked him out with a high kick. And that's where my uh, interest for Dwayne, that's where it, it, it was born. Because I go, man, this kid is a real fighter. Had great technique. You know, Ludwig on his shin tattooed. I had a, a tattoo on my shin. So, yeah, we, we had a connection right away. And that's where we uh, became friends. Ludwig actually remembers meeting Boss at a K-1 event in Las Vegas prior to that. I was hanging out in the hotel lobby waiting for the K-1 fighters to go by and I could make photos with the K-1 fighters. And Boss came down and I made a photo of him. And Boss was hanging out downstairs at the bottom of the lobby. And the next fighter that came out was Peter Arts. So I wanted to get a photo of Peter Arts. But nobody was around to make the photo of us early in the morning. So Boss took my camera and made the photo of Peter Arts and I. And I always remember that and thought, man, how cool that was. That such a high-level star still helped out, you know, a fan from high school, the photo. It was just a nice uh, example of the warrior in the garden because, you know, he could kill most people the, who have ever walked the earth. But yeah, he was still humble enough to uh, take care of somebody below him. Boss immediately took an interest in Ludwig and became his primary coach for the early part of his career. Look, we share some of the things he learned from Boss early on. Belief, intensity, and theory. Understanding how certain strikes and combinations set up others. He taught me again how to think, believe, and train. Bang and Boss had great success together. Bang was considered the top 155-pound fighter in the world at one time under Boss's guidance. Ludwig found Boss to be a great teacher and mentor. When Boss held paths for me or trained me or gave me advice, you could tell that it was pure, it was genuine, it was for real. And it was honest. It was his honest theory. And then also, he's been there and he's done that. So there was no second guessing his advice, his coaching, his mentorship. Because I knew he's been there, he's done that. And if he's going to give me the same, whatever information he's giving me, it's from his heart. And his heart has learned all these lessons throughout the world. So invaluable, invaluable, 100%. Boss and Bang remain friends to this day. Ludwig went on to become the head coach at the famed Team Alpha Male in Sacramento, California for a while, before starting his own gym in Denver, Colorado. He even formed the Boss Rutan inspired Bang Muay Thai system which builds off the system Boss created and evolves it with other elements as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm really extremely proud of him. What he did with this system, you know, uh, like my system is everything. It's hard power, you know. You, you, you don't see a lot of jabs. Everything I do is try to knock you out or to set you up in a shot. If a jab doesn't work to that, well, make it a left straight. Make it a powerful. You force him to bring the hands up. We'll expose the body, and then you go for the body. So... Once he had, I, I trained like that with him, but of course he started adding all his other, his own stuff. So the bases, the power shots, everything, that's my system. But then he starts switching stances. He starts moving and little setups here and there. And now looking back on it and, and, and doing his system also at our gym, I go, man, that would have been fun for me to, to fight like that as well. You know, he, he really took it to the next level. Since retiring, Boss has established himself as one of the top martial arts instructors in the industry. When he isn't teaching at his gym, Basarut and Elite MMA, he is often traveling for seminars. 
When it comes to fine-tuning your striking techniques, you'll be hard-pressed to find a better teacher than Boss, as UFC Hall of Famer and six-time champion Randy Couture explains. Uh, no more technical fighter that, that I've met and uh, has an energy and enthusiasm that's contagious to every single person that, that he meets, that he comes across. I mean, he, he's great. Boss and Randy opened a gym in California in 2006, aptly named Legends Gym. Both Boss and Randy have since divested in the gym, but it's still in operation today. Boss has always been very transparent with his ideas, his techniques, and his thinking. It is one of the reasons why he's been successful in so many endeavors. No other elite-level fighter has released instructional videos where they share most, if not all, of their tricks and techniques. His body action system is one of the most comprehensive instructional programs for a young striker or any person looking to learn some techniques and get in shape. One of the things that sets Boss's martial arts system apart from many others is the fact that while it advances into high-level techniques, it is simplified in the beginning so that people with little or no experience can access it, as world-class kickboxing trainer Nick Hammer shares. For example, if I would give a seminar, a guy that wouldn't, wouldn't have trained one time in his life, he would have very much problems following my class. I think his system that he created is very good for all kinds of levels of people, you know, and that want to do fight sports. So I think it's a, it's a good thing that he set up. Boss demonstrates a genuine desire to help people in general, as does a close personal friend of his, Amir Peretz. Peretz is one of the leading instructors and practitioners in the self-defense system of the Israeli Defense Forces, known as Krav Maga. In the world of training law enforcement and military personnel and self-defense hand-to-hand combat, he's one of the leading experts and teachers. He also spends a lot of time teaching and training civilians as well. A Renaissance man often has expertise in at least one area and is exceptional in others. Amir points out one of the keys that make Boss special as an instructor. It's his ability to actually to share the knowledge and transfer the knowledge. You know, I know a lot of people that are very, very talented, great fighters, world champions, but not necessarily good teachers, or, or the opposite, great teachers and not necessarily um, that level of fighting skills. So Bas possesses both. Bas and Amir knew they could build capacity together and possibly improve public safety. This system would help all kinds of people, as Amir explains. Uh, military, counter-terror units, uh, pol- law enforcement agencies, a- and civilians all over the world. And it came hand in, hand in hand in a way where we could have uh, created a bridge and a language to take uh, the, the Krav Maga doctrine and the uh, uh, Israeli Defense Forces self-defense doctrine and put it together with the world of the mixed martial arts. As Bas, as you know, is such a great pioneer of um, putting everything together. So just creating a little bridge and connecting the dots is making a program or teaching and cleaning the the techniques and the programs where it's easier for the everyday people uh, to use it uh, not just uh, uh, as a tactic, but in in preventative measures and help empower people, uh, first and foremost. Bas and Amir see the importance of getting these tools into the hands of ordinary people. By showing them how to protect themselves and training them in a few key techniques, they're giving these people confidence and power. There's another aspect of their training that is applicable to everyday life, as Amir explains. Not everybody necessarily uh, fight uh, every day physically, but people fight uh, mentally and emotionally, you know, it's like in in a way with with the everyday um, task and everyday challenges or hurdles that they have to pass. A Renaissance man has a strong knowledge base and can sometimes serve as a bridge between different crafts and disciplines. Boss Rutten's Big Book of Combat, Volumes 1 and 2, were released in 2002. This comprehensive guide contains over 500 pages on all aspects of the fighting game. It covers ways to train, striking techniques, submission setups and finishes, pretty much everything you can imagine. He enlisted the help of his trusted friend, Stephen Quadros, to co-author it with him. Well, that was pretty much all Boss's idea. Boss knew the nuts and bolts. I mean, I, I don't know more about the aspect of leg locks and fighting and, you know, how to transition from one thing to another. I do know a lot, but Boss is the master. So I was the editor at the time of a magazine called Fight Sport, and I had a column in Black Belt Magazine for, I think, three years uh, called Fight Sport, and they gave me my own magazine. So I was kind of this guy. I could paint pictures about history and put things together. So I basically wrote all the things that had to do with sending up, like the introduction of the book and maybe some introductions to certain volumes, you know, about 
certain holes or certain strikes or whatnot. So I've kind of filled in the, the blanks, but boss was the maturity of that volume. As, as a matter of fact, with all the fighting techniques, I had no input on that. He did all that himself. Boss talks about how these techniques are battle-tested by him and are the techniques that made him a world champion. Boss was able to adapt to situations throughout his life and be innovative at the same time. When he fought in Pancras, he was able to evolve his fighting style in order to be successful. After he created the Big Book of Combat, he transferred all that content into a video format and released it on DVD so people could watch the moves if they wanted. He also evolved the Big Book of Combat into a workout series that serves as another avenue to introduce Boss's fighting system to the masses. Boss released a career DVD set where he provides commentary to all of his fights. Boss has since removed all these videos onto his YouTube channel for everyone to enjoy for free. In January of 2006, a new concept of mixed martial arts emerged with the International Fight League. Instead of competing as an individual, the IFL would present the sport in a team format with coaches, team names, and mascots. Boss was selected to be one of the coaches for the new league, along with other legendary fighters. Steven Quadros also joined the IFL as an analyst. It didn't take long for executives to realize that Boss could probably help them in more ways than one. That was fantastic because he was one of the coaches, and at first it was Kenny Rice and I <clears throat> in calling the, the show. And well, Kenny's a great broadcaster, and I had a wonderful time warning, working with him and learning so much from him. But then they saw, wait, Boston Stephen have got this huge reputation and this kind of like, uh, I, I guess that you could say, legacy as this two man booth over with Cry Fighting Championships. Why don't we put them together? And they did for a short period of time, and I, I thought it was awesome because it was a thing where we just look at each other and we kind of smile and they just say, roll the tape, man, let's go. It was during this time with the IFL that Boss first met and forged a friendship with another gentleman, legendary sports broadcaster Kenny Rice. He was very gracious to me early on. I mean, I'd covered boxing. I'd covered a lot of sports. Uh, at one time, I'd covered collegiate wrestling, but that'd been several years earlier. I knew enough about MMA, but Boss welcomed me in and told me any questions I had any time. He'd be glad to help. And this is when he was still coaching the team. And then wisely, uh, the International Fight League realized that uh, his Boss brings a lot more to the table than just being a coach, and they moved him over to the broadcast booth. The IFL may have had the potential to change the sport, but it wasn't to be. Unfortunately, the league ended less than three years later. Boss found himself busy away from the IFL and involved in a new show called Inside MMA. When the producers were creating the show, they knew they wanted to pair Boss with a career broadcaster. They asked Kenny Rice if he'd be interested in trying it. As soon as they said Boss Rutten was going to be the guy that's going to be the analyst and the co-host, I said, let's do it. I don't need to know any more about it. Boss and Kenny had great chemistry and were able to help each other. Both were among the best of their craft, yet humble enough to know they still had room for improvement in certain areas. Inside MMA began in 2007 and ran for 10 seasons, making it the longest running mixed martial arts show on television before it ended in 2016. Kenny paired with Boss for the first nine seasons, and then Marvin Allo worked with him for season 10. Then he went viral. In another video on YouTube, Boss Root and Street Defense, he explains different ways to win a bar fight. This video was from a, another, much longer video that was edited to only show the most entertaining parts. The original video was intended to be serious and informational, whereas the YouTube video that went viral kind of mocks it in a good-natured way. Clips courtesy of Boss Root. Everybody underestimates the kick in the groin. Boom! That's the first thing to do. I follow up, bang, bang, bang. Right away after that, dang it, the dang it, the dang. I can also deliver. Bang! Headbutt out of nothing. Boom! The right elbow. Bring right straight. Maybe now the headbutt comes. Knee to the face. And looky, look what we got here. Smack his face. He's actually been involved in video games as well. In 2008, he was featured in the hit video game Grand Theft Auto 4. He was featured on a show within the game called The Men's Room. He also did a lot of the motion capture for the game. When you play as Nico Bellic, the main character, you're basically playing Boss Rutten. The guy who made the, the street fighting uh, clip, the four-minute clip on the internet that we see with the dang, dang, dong, dong, dong. First of yeah. all, I never knew that I made sound effects. So what he did is take a one-hour, 45-minute serious uh, street fighting DVD. He took all the bits out with the, with the sound effects and he cropped it to this four-minute clip and it freaking exploded on the internet. I mean, 90% of my jobs come from that clip and so was 
Grand Theft Auto. You know, they just saw that clip. I got contacted, and they they loved that, what, what I was doing. And if I wanted to do a cameo in Grand Theft Auto, I didn't even know what it was, what kind of game. And my buddies go like, "Dude, that's the biggest video game there is. You should 100 percent do this." In 2012, Foss joined his longtime friend, actor, and comedian Kevin James on James's film Here Comes the Boom. Boss joined Kevin again in 2014 for Kevin's movie Mall Cop 2. During this time, he also attended a conference with his friend and theologian, Leo Severino. Severino gave a presentation on creationism that started a change in his thinking and the way he saw the world. A Renaissance man is always trying to be his best in mind, body, and spirit. Boss's journey to faith was a little different than what some others have experienced. Severino's ideas weren't about damning people to hell. His ideas dismissed the notion that the complexities of human anatomy and other beings happen by accident or just by chance. An analogy that Boss and others have used is by comparing a simple invention, like a mousetrap, to something like a human eye. A mousetrap has five or six parts to it. All of these parts must be in the exact right spot in order for it to work. If someone from another planet were to look at a mousetrap, they wouldn't consider the possibility that these pieces just fell into place and created a mousetrap. They would most likely believe that someone created that mousetrap because there's no way that those things could just come together by chance or by accident. When looking at the human eye from this perspective, an organ with thousands of delicate and sensitive parts, it's easy to see how one could believe it was designed and created. How could all the parts just accidentally fall into place to create such a complex organ that does what it does? This is a different approach to religion than the scare tactics of fire and brimstone that we sometimes see. Something that we see again and again when looking at Boss's life is that he's always been a person to make things happen his own way and carve his own path. When he first saw Enter the Dragon, he went home and drilled his own moves again and again, trying to be like Bruce Lee. As a chef, he had a passion for creating his own dishes and trying to push the envelope with new ideas. When he began working as an entertainer in Holland, he and his partner essentially created an act out of thin air. In Pancreas, he drilled submissions again and again with his own moves and setups to form his own pseudo catch wrestling style that obviously turned out to be very effective. Boss has reinvented himself time and time again, and he's found success in virtually every serious endeavor he's pursued in his life. He's a teacher, a loyal friend, a warrior, a man of faith, and a renaissance man. Like what you just heard? Check us out on Twitter and Instagram, at MMA TrueFan. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube. Please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Special thanks to Boss Rutten, Randy Couture, Jason DeLucia, Chris Dolan, Nick Hemmers, Dwayne Ludwig, Amir Peretz, Stephen Quadros, Kenny Rice, Frank Shamrock, and Ken Shamrock. Music by With Lions Productions, artwork by 